here it comes, stepping down from glory. Bethlehem is just the start of the story. Here he comes. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes, teaching in the temple, making kindness, wisdom sound simple. Here he comes. Here he comes to seek and save, to wash our every sin away. Here the captain starts to say, Here he comes. Here he comes, giving sight to the blind man, calling out, giving life to the dead man. Here he comes. Oh. Comes to sign his loving ring, carries a cross along the way of suffering. Here he comes, here he comes. Come to seek and save, wash our every sin away. Hear the captain start to say, Here he comes. the Lord. Are you looking forward to him to come today? Possibly. You never know. We live with an expectation. We have a living hope within us that one day we will see him just as he is. And we should live with our eyes fixed on the skies, not just running the race, but expecting those clouds uh, to roll back and for our Savior to appear. And praise the Lord, we have that promise from his word. And just as he kept his word and came the first time to bring salvation to mankind, so too God will keep his word and Christ will appear to redeem us. And that's what we praise him for this morning. I want to invite you to join me on the altar as we give thanks for our salvation and the living hope that we carry in our hearts each and every day. As we're praying this morning, we're continuing to pray uh, for Dwight Wallace's family and uh, also uh, for John Allen's family in their passing and that God would just comfort those families and make his presence known as a gentle shepherd. We're celebrating today with Pastor Pauly and Miss Amanda, their birth of their granddaughter as they're away, and uh, praise the Lord for that precious gift that God has given them. We want to pray for families. I know it's back to school time, and the college students are already heading off and going back, and that's a big transition for families, particularly if it's your first one, so we want to pray for our students as they head off. But school, elementary school and grade school will be here just around the corner, and so we also want to pray for our parents and students and also the teachers as well. And praise the Lord this week, we've got our permit, we can start moving dirt on our missions warehouse. So praise the Lord, that's officially in our hands, and we can start moving dirt on 10 acres of land back in the North 40 over there. So we praise the Lord, and we look forward to how God's going to bring that warehouse to pass. I want to invite you again to join with me here on the altar as we pray. Let's go before the Lord, let's praise Him that we have a living hope, and that our Savior and our King is coming one day to save us and to take us home. And our Listen, you may know someone that you need to pray for right now that doesn't have that hope. An opportunity that we have to share 
with them before he comes because then it'll be too late. And so let's pray that God will allow us, enable us to give us opportunities to have some divine appointments this week and to share with those that don't know him yet so that they can come to know Jesus Christ and have a living hope within him. Pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, thank you that you have given us a living hope that Jesus Christ not only has died and was buried, but he rose again and he ascended to your right hand. He is there awaiting your command to go get my children. Father, thank you that we could gather today, the family of faith, the household of God, to praise your name and to thank you for all the promises that you have given us. Lord, that until that day when Christ appears, your promise is that your grace will be sufficient, whatever we may face. And we've experienced that this week. God, you have sustained us. You have supplied for us. God, you have secured us. Lord, you have been present as our gentle shepherd. We thank you as your sheep. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the comforter and that, Lord, your spirit of comfort is with some families that have lost loved ones. And we pray that they would just continue to know your peace, your presence. God, we praise you for new life. It's precious, Lord, every time a, a baby is entrusted to a family. And God, we thank you for this gift and we pray your blessings upon her. Lord, we also pray for families that are sending kids back to school. It's a time of transition out of the summer and back into some routines. And Father, we just pray that as those uh, transitions happen, Lord, that you would encourage families and perhaps their first ones going off to school. Lord, just be with them and encourage them that all will be well. And God, for the plans and purposes you have for our children, God, that's why you entrusted them to us, Lord. They're arrows that one day we fling out, we fire out into this world to, to hit the target and to make a difference for your kingdom. And so we pray for our students that as you're preparing them for that and as they're going out now, Lord, that they would do great things for you. Lord, it's good to be in your house today to gather with brothers and sisters to celebrate our living hope and to realize Lord, that we once though were separated from you, we weren't your people, now we've become your people. And Lord, your abiding presence, your spirit dwells within us until our Savior and King comes. We're praying now that you would bless our worship as we magnify his name. God, let our hearts be filled with your spirit as we sing, as we give, as we surrender to your will revealed in your word. And God, may all of it be fragrant to you, a fragrant offering of our lives, sacrifices to you. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of this this morning in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior and coming King. And all God's people said amen and amen. Amen. Again, it's good to see you in God's house this morning. Those that are gathered here at Chipley Ford Road and, and those that are watching online as well, we're grateful that you chose to worship with us. If you're visiting here in the sanctuary, we just have one request, if you don't mind, if this is your first time with us. Just remain seated and allow our church family to come welcome you into the house of the Lord. We're going to do that right now by having all of our church family stand at this time to greet one another. And as you're doing that, find our guests, make them feel welcome in God's house.
As we gather back together this morning, let us continue praising God for the wonderful deliverance that he has given to us at Calvary. saves wretched sinners like ourselves.
joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes, yes the world God that we serve a saving Lord and master and not only that has he saved us but he has given us a word that we might learn more about him and when we look into that word what happens church God speaks amen God speaks so let us listen as he speaks this morning sacrifice and offering you did not desire my ears you have opened burnt offering and sin offering you did not require then I said Behold, I come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is written within my heart. David here shows that he knew what his predecessor did not, that to obey is better than sacrifice. This obedience is not something that springs up naturally out of us in our fallen state. Quite to the contrary, it is something Paul says that God works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Without the Spirit changing us radically, we would be hopelessly lost in our sin and our rebellion against God, the Most High. Therefore, since God is our soul, therefore, since God is the only one who is saving us and is not we ourselves, Let us praise him as our great defense and as the conqueror of all his enemies. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength, though my heart is free.
Father, we come to you this morning praising you that we're even able to be here, God, that you have set us apart as a people for your own inheritance, God. Lord, it is nothing that we do that merits us to be here, God. It is only you, God. If it was dependent upon us, not a single one of us would make it, God. I just ask that you would be with this service, Lord, that you would use this offering that's about to be taken up, Lord, and you would give Pastor Chris the words to say as he comes and brings the word of the Lord to us, God. I ask that you would give us open hearts and that you would have us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, Lord. Ask all this in your name for your glory. Amen. The only thing that matters to me There in sorrow He sees my tomorrow His ear is always listening Behold the Seated high upon the throne, behold the Lamb I will honor, magnify the Holy One, more than able, God.
I almost want to ask her for an encore. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We don't have to wait to get there to behold the Lamb. We should be beholding Him each and every day. Opening God's Word and seeing Him right there on the pages as He reveals Himself to us. Children, you can head off to Children's Church now and you're going to open God's Word and behold the Lamb and see God. And as He reveals Himself, He's chosen to reveal Himself in His Word to us. Now, creation speaks. It shows us there's a glorious God, but... It's in His Word that He reveals Himself to us. The amazing thing as you're taking your copy of God's Word and turning back to John's Gospel is those who diligently searched the Scriptures, I mean, they had the Scriptures, they had been entrusted with Him, they didn't see Him when He appeared. They had the Word, and, and they had everything that God had promised right before them, and yet when He appeared to them, as we'll see in this chapter, in John chapter 5, they refuse to recognize him as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And we're turning to John's Gospel. We took a little interlude there and studied Jude's epistle because there are some urgent things that needed to be shared and reminded for you and for me who contend for the faith. But John is writing, writing for us so that we will believe. Remember his purpose in writing this Gospel. It's not a historical Gospel like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those that are more historical accounts that are written to both the Jewish people in Matthew's gospel, to the Gentile world in Luke's gospel, and then Mark bringing them together in a summary of Peter's preaching there in Rome, most likely. This gospel was written with a theological purpose. John is making the case as he presents the life of Christ. He's laying out the evidences why you and I should believe. Things that Jesus spoke and seven miraculous things that he did and he says, listen, I'm writing this that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you may have life in his name. That's what God's desire is right now. When you and I open this gospel as we read it this morning, is that we will see him as he truly is and we'll believe. And as we behold the Lamb that came to take away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist said in John chapter 1, we'll put our faith and our trust in him. What would it take for you to believe? Now when we left off from John's gospel. In the first 14, 15 verses there. <clears throat> we had met a man who had been lame for 38 years. And Jesus met him there at the pool at Bethsaida. And, and he said to him. Um, Just pick up your mat and go home. You don't have to get down in the water. And the man had faith. And he believed. And, and he stood up and went home. And, and as he went home. Uh, the, the Pharisees got a little upset. He, he was violating the Sabbath, carrying his mat. And he said, well, the man who told me, who made me well said to take my mat and go home. And who is he? Well, Jesus. He didn't know who he was, of course. He, after he met him in the temple, Jesus said, listen, go and sin no more. You know, don't, don't continue to sin. It'll be a worse thing for you. That's when the man said it was Jesus. And the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they got upset. They were upset. And you would think... A man, listen, if you and I knew someone who had been lame for 38 years and someone spoke to them and said, you are now made well, get up and go home, I mean, it would be pretty miraculous, wouldn't it? I mean, certainly we would believe when we see that. And yet, in spite of that, and that's not the only miracle that they've seen. They, they've seen him do others, I mean, cast out a demon of a demoniac. They've, they, on the Sabbath, they, they've seen him uh, do miraculous things, uh, other healings and and yet, at this point, this is revealed, and man, are they mad. Now, the reason they're mad is not because Jesus has healed a man, helped the helpless man. They, they, they didn't prosecute the man who was carrying the mat home when he was violating the Sabbath. But, oh, did they want to persecute Jesus. They wanted to remove this one. He, he had already been doing miraculous things. Remember, Nicodemus had come and said, listen, nobody can be sent from God that does these miracles. I mean, you have to be sent by God. No one can do miraculous things like this unless God has sent him. So they knew. Some of them were willing to accept it, but most of them weren't. They weren't willing to acknowledge it. The problem wasn't that he healed the man. The problem was that he did it on the Sabbath. And the problem wasn't so much that he did it on the Sabbath. It was that he was, he was challenging all of their traditions about the law. And because of that, they had to eliminate this one. And yet all he was doing, as he'll show us here, is just the will of his father. 
In fact, that psalm that we read that David wrote, the son of David was just fulfilling that psalm. He, he, his ear was dug. He was a doulos, a bondservant. He delighted to do his father's will. And he only did what he saw the father doing. And that's his simple return to them when he spoke back to them, when he responded to them. But they ignored all those good deeds. You know, a lot of people today ignore all the good things God is doing. Romans chapter 2, God is doing a lot of good things in people's life. He is long-suffering. He is patient. He is doing good things for us. And yet, why does he do that? That we would repent and turn to him. And yet, these would not repent. These who were so close to the word of God. They had actually studied it. And yet, because he did this, they were upset. In fact, he's helping the helpless. He's helping the hopeless. And their, their intent is just to destroy Jesus. You know, they didn't like that when he spoke to them, he said, I and the Father are one, making himself God. They couldn't stand that thought. This is not the Messiah. He doesn't come this way. It's not the way the Messiah comes. Their hard hearts, their stiff necks, their refusal to believe. You, Stop and think about some people that we've witnessed to, we've shared with throughout the years. You may be witnessing even this week. And they're unwilling to accept the claims that Jesus made about himself. Unwilling to choose to believe. And what has to happen? Well, the Spirit, listen, believe what God's Word says. The Spirit is working. Believe that the Spirit is wooing them. That's what God's Word tells us. And you and I need to pray sometimes for softened hearts and for the blinders to be removed and that they would see and that they would believe. Remember, that's why this is written. Sometimes the best thing you can do is give them a copy of John. If it's written so that we might believe and that we might have life in his name, let's, let's give them the gospel of John and, and let God's word work on their lives. That's, that's sometimes what we have to choose to believe to do. Jesus is going to give evidence why we should believe. He's going to give evidence that he is fully God. He's going to give full evidence, listen, that, that he has the power to give life. And that's summarized right here. And then the question is always, will you believe? Will you believe this morning? Not just in this sanctuary, those watching online. Listen, will you believe the truth about who Jesus is and the power that he has to give life to those who are dead? In fact, it's amazing how Jesus' response here really marries up, uh, meshes well with what John's purpose is in his epistle, or in this gospel, as he's writing to us. So I want you to stand with me as we read. I'm just going to read a few verses to get into this, because I've got to go from verse 16 all the way to the end of the chapter. And so buckle up, we're going to have to go through this this morning, but we've got plenty of time. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus. What reason? Well, because he had made the man well on the Sabbath. And they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Father in heaven, would you speak to us today? Father in heaven, I pray that your spirit who inspired John to write this gospel would open our eyes, illumine our eyes, illumine our heart, God, that we might see and we might believe the truth that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah who has come to give us life, life eternal. And God, I pray if there's anyone who doesn't believe today, God, may you remove those blinders that have stopped them and not enable them, Lord, to see. And may you grant them faith and repentance, Lord, that they might be wooed to you, drawn to you, and that they might experience life that Christ has to offer them, the fullness of life that Jesus offers. And we will give you all the praise and glory and honor for it, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Jesus is equal with God. That's what he's saying. He is doing what the Father has done. He didn't say our Father, he said my Father. And when he said that, when he said that he was, God was his Father, he made himself equal with God. And that's because he is fully God. They, they were mad because Jesus not only did these deeds on the Sabbath, did these miraculous things on the Sabbath day, they were mad because now he has committed blasphemy. 
He has identified himself as God. And as a result of that, they're going to seek to destroy him, to lead him to the cross where they will crucify him. And all of this is still part of the Father's plan. But Jesus is fully God. He's equal with God. And he lays it out here for us as he responds to them. He answered them, verse 19, and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father whom he has sent. Jesus gives three reasons why he's equal to the Father as he speaks to them. And oh, you know this was convicting to them. But they would not repent. They would not turn to him. Now he is doing this work on the Sabbath. What was the Sabbath made for? The Sabbath was made for man. For man to rest. But that didn't mean that you couldn't do anything good or helpful. Or hopeful or or anything to help those who were in need at that time. We need a day of rest. God designed us that way. Go read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and you see what God provided the first thing man was to experience was rest with God shalom with God after he was made on day six the next day he would experience with the father with the with the God who made him is a day of rest and what Jesus says here is listen I am doing exactly what the father is doing even though the father made the day of rest the father's still working The Father's been working ever since that rest was broken by the sin of Adam and Eve. The Father's been working every day to woo mankind back to himself. To bridge the gap that was created by sin. And to bring us into into a right relationship with him. It was fractured by man's rebellion. It's it's, It's destroyed in our lives when we rebel against him. And only the Father can make amends for that. Only the Son can bridge that gap for us. And only the Spirit can open our eyes to realize He's made everything possible so we can be back and be one. All the works that were happening, all the works that the Father was doing, Jesus said, I'm just doing what the Father's doing. He is working in me and through me. In fact, He anticipates something here in verse 21 when He mentions that the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom He will. In a moment, we're going to see down in verses 24 through 30 how that resurrection, that the one who gives life is God who has life, and Jesus is just like the Father in that. In fact, John will say later, He's the resurrection and the life. Jesus is doing precisely what God has always been doing. In fact, just as the Father will not judge anyone, He will not judge those. It says here that He has given that judgment to the Son. He's committed judgment to Him. Now what's fascinating here is that in mentioning the works that He does, the signs, the miraculous things that the Father's doing, and highlighting the the resurrection of the dead, which of all the signs that have been done, that's the most important one. That that, that resurrection of the dead, as Paul would say, because Christ was raised from the dead, he has the right to judge all those who die because of their sins and all those who are made alive who have faith in him. And that judgment is entrusted to the Son as the Lord of the Sabbath. And not only that, those who honor the Father should honor the Son who he's placed in that position. Those who say, I I worship God, but have no regard for Jesus, are not really honoring the Son. And if you don't honor the Son, you can't honor the Father who sent Him. So Jesus is making the case, listen, look at the miraculous things that I'm doing. Listen to the judgment that I have the right one day to put on mankind, to assess mankind, to judge mankind. And consider the honor that is given to the Father and should be given to the Son. All of these things demonstrate that I am equal with the Father. And you should trust in me. But oh, they don't want to trust in Him. They don't want to acknowledge Him. They don't want to recognize Him. And the sad thing is, you cannot honor the Father if you do not honor Jesus as well. 
You know, in our day and age, it's amazing how many people want to honor God. No want to talk about honoring God. Man, you mention the name Jesus, and it just separates. Listen, our willingness to testify that Jesus is Lord is critical to our faith. It's essential to our faith. The acknowledgement that He is fully God and our faith rests in Him. There, that confession has to come from our hearts and our lips. And because we do that, we honor the Father who sent Him into our lives. And just as Jesus did all these miraculous works that are recorded in these scriptures so that you and I will see and believe, there, there's another great work that He is doing a greater work, and, and the greater work is something that hopefully he's done in your life today. He's done in my life, those who are watching online. Hopefully he's done this in your life. And what is that great work? It's given life to the dead. Given life to the dead. And that's what he says in verses 24 through 30. There's three resurrections that he hints at, he speaks of here. And it's these miraculous works that he, he's going to do one day. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, verse 24, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Now, now those who hear what Jesus says and believe in him now have eternal life. Well, that would mean that we were dead. How were we dead? Well, this is the miraculous work that Christ does in the believer's heart. When you and I recognize, man, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. The soul that sinneth it shall surely die. The moment that Adam sinned in the garden, he was dead spiritually. Anyone that sins, listen, you may be upright and walking, but unless you have repented and believed and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a dead man walking. But the moment we say, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, I put my faith in the sacrifice that you offer, the only one who did everything that what the Father asked him to do, Jesus, who died at Calvary, the moment we put our faith and trust in him, the Bible says that we are given eternal life. It's not just heaven, it's now. We were dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul would say it this way. That when we were under the influence of the spirit of this world, the spirit of darkness, we were children of wrath. We deserved death. We deserved doom. And yet God, who was rich in mercy, redeemed us and gave us life. And we've been raised from the dead in that sense. We who were dead are now made alive. And that's the first resurrection that happens in our life. When we repent of our sins, when we hear the word, and when we believe, we are given new life in this body. And it's an amazing life to have. Every day, listen, Christ Jesus said what to the woman at the well? Listen, when I give you this water, it's going to bubble up within you and flow out of you. That's the life he comes to bring for you and for me. This is what we should experience each and every day. And the only way that it happens is when we're in right relationship with him, and that's only possible through Jesus, who is the Messiah. But that's not the only resurrection he highlights. That's the first one. That's the essential one. He says, listen, when, when we've put our faith in him, we will not come into judgment. He's going to mention that a little bit later. But he has, we have passed from death into life. Man, praise God, there's no condemnation to us who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 1? That's what Jesus said right here. We will not, we will, we will not come into the judgment that is to come. But he says, most assuredly, verse 25, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those will hear who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming which all those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. You see, beloved, if we die in this body, though we're alive, we have eternal life. Our bodies go into the grave. Our spirit goes to the presence of God immediately. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's coming a day when our bodies are going to come up out of those graves. And if we are already in heaven, we'll be reunited with a glorified body. Praise the Lord. And that's what we look forward to unless the Lord comes and snatches us away and raptures us out. 
That is the promise that we have. We're going to have glorified bodies one day that will never experience growing old. They will never experience any brokenness. They will never experience any sickness and disease. That is coming one day. A resurrection for life. In fact, Paul would write to the Thessalonians over in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18. Oftentimes, we read this at the graveside. I read it just this week uh, with Brother Dwight at the graveside with his family. It's something actually he marked in his Bible. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Those who have died in Jesus, they're present with the Lord. Their bodies are in the graves, but they're present with the Lord. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means precede those who are asleep or who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. There is a resurrection, there will be a rapture, and there will be a reunion one day. That's what Paul says there for us. And that gives us hope, that gives us comfort, that your faith and my faith is not in vain. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we do not have this hope. But we do have this hope because he was raised from the dead. In fact, as he was raised from the dead, that's when he spoke to Thomas there in John chapter 20 and 21. He said, look Thomas, look at my body. Go ahead, stick your hand in my side. Look at these nail prints, right? Thomas is like, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, oh, you've seen and believed. Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. That's you and that's me. We're the ones now like that. And because of that, there's coming a day when we will be raised and we will forever be in the presence of the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day. I don't know about you. Amen? In fact, over in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 in verses 4 through 6, it talks about that resurrection of life that will be experienced. But there's another resurrection, but it's not to life, but it's to destruction, to damnation. In fact, Jesus speaks of it even here at the end of verse 29. And coming forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Mm. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. You see, for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, those who have been convicted of their sin by the Spirit of God, those who say, I've got no hope, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. I need a Lamb to take away my sin. And they trust in Jesus. The Bible says that we have a living hope. But whoever does not receive the word, anyone who says, I don't want to receive the light. I don't want to surrender to the will of God. Those who reject him and continue to rebel against him, they die and they go into the grave. And the Bible says one day in Revelation chapter 20, one day, verses 11 through 15, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. And the great and the small, all classes of people, male and female, will stand, those who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus, before the throne of God. And books will be opened, and the Lamb's book of life. And whoever's name is not found written in that Lamb's book of life will have no hope. You see, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul would say to the Corinthians, knowing this to be true, We persuade those around us. We're burdened for those around us. Because there is going to be a resurrection of their life one day. And that resurrection will not be to everlasting life in the presence of a gracious and good and bountiful God. The almighty God. But it will be to damnation. It will be to punishment and condemnation. It's called hell. And it's a reality though. We don't like to talk about it. And you certainly don't hear about it preached enough. But it's still a place. There are only two, two destinations. It is either heaven or it is hell. There is no middle ground. There's not even a purgatory. It is either heaven or it is hell. And the only way you get there and to heaven is by faith 
in the only sacrifice sufficient that was offered, and that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, this day of resurrection is coming. Hopefully, listen, you've already experienced that. You and I who are dead in our trespasses and sin, you and I who say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I can't save myself. I bend my knee. Jesus Christ, you are Lord, and I trust in you. And then our life demonstrates that. You realize when John the Baptist was speaking to those Pharisees, they were coming out and checking him out. What's this prophet doing? You remember what he said? The axe is laid at the root. You better repent and bring forth fruits bearing of repentance. The time is now. You need to get your life right. And yet they wouldn't recognize his testimony. In fact, that's really what it is. Jesus, listen, notice what he's done. He has laid this out as he responds to them just the way John has written his gospel. I am equal with God. I'm God's son. I'm the Messiah who has the responsibility to judge all things. And by the way, isn't it good that he's the judge? No man can be the judge. Only God could be the judge. Why? Because see, only God would know all things, have all the evidence. I mean, that's what a judge does, right? I mean, he doesn't just write a warrant, you know, for some for political reasons and assign that. Well, maybe they do today. Um, no, no, no. A judge, a righteous judge would do what is right and just. So we would want that kind of judge. We would want a judge that has an even scale, right? A fair scale. We would want a judge who knows all the evidence. He knows all the motives behind why things are done. That's the kind of judge I would want, amen? That's Jesus. And he has the right to this. He is God's son. He is fully God, fully righteous, fully true, understanding, omniscient, knows all things. That is who he is. And he is the one who gives life. And that's what he said right here. I give the resurrection. I, I make dead men alive. Now, he can do that through belief or unbelief. He can do it through belief when we repent and place our faith and trust in Christ. And we're saved. But even those who are not believing one day will be raised. And they will be judged at the great white throne judgment. So really, the question is, will you believe? And that's where it comes down to in verse 31. Because the testimony has gone forth. The witness of God has gone forth. And you have to respond to the light that God gives you. We're all accountable for what light God gives us. Notice what he says here. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Verse 31. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sinned to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. This is John the Baptist. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his life. But I have a greater witness than John's. You see... John the Baptist was sent by God. John the Baptist was preparing the way. John the Baptist was saying, repent, get your life right. The Lamb of God, there he is right there. He's the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And they would not believe that light. We read about that light several months ago when we were in John chapter 1. And what happens? Do you know that light comes into the darkness? And darkness is just like, no, I don't want it, I don't want it. I mean, he warned them, that brood of vipers, to get their lives right. All these people lined up that were coming down into the waters saying, I'm a sinner, God have mercy. They were getting ready for the coming of the Messiah. And through repentance and faith, getting their lives right. But not these Pharisees. No, no, no. John was bearing witness, but they didn't receive that witness. They, they, they rejoiced in, in, in some ways seeing him, but, but, but they, didn't, they didn't trust in Jesus. And yet Jesus says, I don't just have the witness of John the Baptist. I've got another witness. It's even greater than that. It's the works. Verse 36, the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do. These bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You see, these works that Jesus was doing, he's already set up, established that. I'm only doing what the Father's been doing. I don't do anything of my own accord. I only do the will of my Father. Remember, behold, it's written of me, I in the scroll, I delight to do thy will. And that's all Jesus has done. Will you not believe him? 
Will you not believe the works that he has done, the Father has done, the assigned him to do, the works that he has given, all the miraculous things? I mean, this is a theological gospel that John is laying out. He's just going to present seven miraculous things because he wants us to see and believe. But Jesus did many more things, John would tell us at the end of his gospel. Many more th- pages could be written. There's not enough pages of books that we could to record all that Jesus did. And yet Jesus says these things, these works, greater than even John's testimony, because they are bearing witness of me that the Father, he has sent me, because I'm just doing what the Father wants me to do. And if that's not enough, the works that Christ has done, he says the Father has has borne witness of me in another way. Notice this in verse 37. The Father himself who sent me has testified of me. When did the Father testify of him? You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you. Because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. How did the Father testify of the Son? Through the Word. The Word speaks and reveals the Son. Isn't that amazing? Stop and think. How did John's Gospel start? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And what did that Word do? It became flesh and dwelt among us. And and when you go and you look at the word in the Old Testament, which anticipated the word taking on flesh, which pointed to the coming of Jesus, the Father has testified. He's given witness. You go in from Genesis all the way to Revelation. But if they only had the Old Testament at this point, from Genesis to Malachi, there's a scarlet thread woven all throughout there of the promised seed that God would send that would crush the serpent's head and save mankind and it's Jesus he'd be the son of Abraham he'd be the son of David he'd be born in Bethlehem he'd be betrayed for 30 shekels of silver all these things are recorded you take all the prophecies of the birth of Christ his life even his death as David would say in Psalm 22 uh, uh, the Psalm of the cross the way the Messiah would be crucified. All of these things testify. And he's saying, you have the word and you will not believe. In fact, you think you have eternal life because you have the word. But the truth is you don't have the word abiding in you. They were not willing to put their faith in this word and trust in him. Now, you know what's amazing? God is speaking. He's speaking right now to all of us. He's speaking to you. Listen, when we open the word, we hear him speak. And his spirit who inspired this word wants to illumine our hearts and minds. And he wants you and I to surrender to the message that we hear and what we we see God say about himself. And what God says is you and I are dead in our trespasses and sin. We have no hope. We must put our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And the moment we do we are born again we are raised from the dead and we have life and we have the promise of eternal life in his presence forever and ever but they refuse the word verse 38 you do not have his word abiding in you they would not come to him verse 40 but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life They despised him, despite all the works that he did, but despite what the word he was sharing with them. Why? Because they had no love for God. Verse 42, I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. Who would know that? Only the God who knows all things. Only God who knows the motives of man's heart. Only the God, well, his son, Jesus, that he's committed judgment to. They would not receive him. Verse 43, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. That would be a false messiah, a deceiver. They'll receive that one, but they would not receive Jesus. They sought honor from men, but not from God. How can you believe who receive honor from men and uh, uh, from one another? But you do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. You see, their own ambition, their spiritual desires uh, were not to honor God, but to honor themselves and build themselves up. We've seen that in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught. They would not listen to God speaking to them. Now, 
How does faith come? This is critical. Faith doesn't come by seeing. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing specifically what? The Word of God. Hearing God's Word. Now, beloved, it'd be easy to say, you know, if Jesus was here and I saw all those miracles, I would believe. That's not guaranteed. But you see, what we have, Peter says, is while they had the amazing word, they saw the transfiguration, they saw the Lord. Peter, who was on that mountain, says, we've got even a more sure word today. It's right here. This inspired word. And you and I, this is what we have to believe. This is what God has spoken to you and to me. You and I have to take him at his word and choose to believe. Not reject him, not rebel against him, not stay in that rebellion, but to say, God, have mercy on me. You're God and I'm not. I can't save myself, but I believe Jesus died on that cross, paid the penalty I deserve, and I want to put my trust in his sacrifice. If you've never done that, you need to do that while there's time. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. You see, when you do do that, then you follow the Lord in obedience. The first step of obedience is to go through the waters of baptism. In the next service, we're going to baptize seven people that have made that profession of faith. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you know what's amazing there? Just one child, one teenager, the rest are all uh, older men. Men who have put their faith and trust in Christ. This isn't just a decision for children, though it's simple enough for a child to believe. But it's for everyone to believe. And if you've never done that, then I want to encourage you to do that today, to get your life right. Because, beloved, no one knows when Christ is going to appear. And you must be ready. I mean, we sang, here he comes. Here he comes. Are you ready if he comes? Because he might come today. And we need to be ready. He is the only hope we have to give us life and to save us from destruction. He is without question the Messiah. He is without question the Son of God. And He is without question the only one who can give us everlasting life. We, we've heard the truth today. The question is how will we respond? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And the opportunity is given today for us to put our faith and trust in Jesus. And to ask Him to be our Savior and our Lord. If you've never done that, then at this time, the pastors are here in the front. We're all looking within. Has there been a moment in my life where I've said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. The Spirit of God has convicted me, and I know that I cannot save myself. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, then we invite you to do that this morning. Just come say, I need Jesus. I need to be saved from my sins. Now, maybe you have done that. And you are attached to him. He is the head. He is your, the one who has saved you. He has a body called the church. And it's not right to be attached to a body, to a head and not be attached to a body. His desire is that we lock arms with other believers. We navigate life together. We run this race of faith. And we encourage one another and build one another up. And so maybe God has led you here to South River Baptist Church to plant your life here to be a part of this body of believers. And this is a time that the invitation is extended to you as well to come and to plant your life here. Maybe you're coming saying, I know Jesus, but I need a, a church family to be a part of. This is the time that we would do that. Maybe you're burdened this morning because you know someone that is not part of the family of God, someone that is not receiving the word of God, and you just need to pray for them, that God would remove the blinders, that our hearts would be burdened to pray for the lost. God's desire is that none perish, but all come to repentance. Will you pray for that today, for that individual who needs Jesus? Even now, maybe this week, maybe you're going to go home and see him at lunchtime. Maybe you're going to see him this week at work. Maybe you're going to see him when you go back to school, a friend on your ball team. Listen, you know they don't need Jesus. Are you burdened for their salvation? Paul says to the Corinthians again, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing that hell is real. Knowing that if they don't repent and place their faith in Jesus, that is their destiny. Are you burdened for their salvation? 
Will you not pray for that salvation today? Whether on the altar or there in the pew. That God would enable us to give a good testimony to them. And then for those that are part of the family of faith, praise Him today. Praise Him that though you and I were dead in our trespasses and sin, we've been made alive. Give thanks today. We should give thanks each and every day. Not just for the physical life that we have, but the spiritual life that we enjoy day by day with Him. Praise Him for that even now. Gracious Father, our eyes look to you this morning. Thank you for helping us to see we were in desperate need of a Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. May that be the testimony of our lives as the people of God, knowing that nothing will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Father in heaven, Lord, may we who believe in you be bold as the body of Christ. May we testify to the world around us what Christ has done in our lives. May we tell them what Jesus can do in their life. And God, as we do that, will you woo them to yourself? No one can come to the Father unless he is drawn. No one can come to the Son unless the Spirit works in their life. Spirit of God, work in the hearts of these that we are burdened for this morning. God, we lay them before you, whether through our words and testimony or through someone else. God, we pray even now that you would bring someone across their path to sow the hope of heaven in their hearts so that they might see and believe. Father, thank you. One day, Jesus is coming. Help us to live for that glorious day. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Amen.